What's going on, people? It's Rob Dukes. Welcome to the Put Up Your Dukes podcast. How are you guys doing? How was your weekend? I hope you ate badly. I hope you got fucking shit-faced and enjoyed a fucking solid football game. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm new to the football game thing. I uh, only started watching football a couple years ago. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of watching the past, but not really. Um... But uh, in the last couple of years, I've been uh, hanging out with a group of guys who we uh, we watch uh, a lot of football. Um, I'm a hockey guy, but there's been no good hockey because it's been uh, the uh, the All Star break. So um, let's talk football. Uh, I bet um, uh, that the Gatorade would be yellow. It was blue. I lost. Uh, I didn't bet on really much else. Uh, I thought. Uh, uh, the defense of L.A. really kind of won that game, especially toward the end. I liked that there was not a lot of penalties to the game. Uh, the things at the end were kind of suspect, but when aren't they? You know, as a hockey fan, um, I see refs call nightmarish shit. Um, and it's so inconsistent, but that's the human nature of uh, being a referee. I've never actually talked to a referee. I would love to talk to a referee. Uh and sit down and, and pick their brain on. So, I know that recently they called a uh, they they somebody admitted that he called a play on a team that was suspect because he realized he missed a call earlier in the game. So he kind of like, well, I missed that call earlier, so I'm going to call that one, which is but it was kind of like not really a penalty. Um, I've seen horrific things in hockey where they just... It happens right in front of the guy, and they just don't call it. And you're like, dude, that's a blatant fucking penalty, you piece of shit. Um, I only say that when it goes against my team. If it's for my team, uh, you know, I'm glad they missed it. And the referees uh, hopefully make money off that. I know that basketball had the referees were making... They were calling games because they were betting on it. That was like a scandal. I don't watch basketball, so I don't know, but I do know that that happened. I also know... Here's a story I heard this week. There was a guy on the Phoenix Suns. So the Phoenix Suns are doing real, really well right now. So everyone's kind of like... Dit, 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 dit. My buddy told me that the star player uh, at one point... I don't know his name. He was white. And uh, he uh, was on the team, and they were making a run for the for the in the playoffs. And he had a kid during the playoffs, and into the delivery room, uh, the kid uh, came out black, and it was one of his teammates, his baby. And uh, I look, I've been through some shit in my life. I don't even. I, I want. I would love to ask him, dude. What went through your brain? Like, was it, did you want to, like, choke her out? You know what I mean? Did you want, did you walk out of the room and never look back? Did you, were you, how fucking angry would you be? I mean, the betrayal must have been, and what a fucking idiot she is. I mean, I mean, that's, you know, his teammate, teammate is a piece of shit, but the wife is a bigger piece of shit for sure. Um, but, uh. Yeah, what a fucking weird thing, huh? Anyway, today's episode is brought to you by MartyrStore.net. Cannibal Corpse George. Can, cannibal Corpse George. Cannibal, I suck. Cannibal Corpse frontman George. George <laughs> oh, I'm so stupid. MartyrStore.net. Cannibal Corpse frontman George Corpse Grinder Fisher. Was dropping his debut album February 25th. That's like in a week. I think it's, yeah, it's like fucking 10 days from now. Uh, you can uh, pre order it at martyrstore.net. The Corpse Grinder uh, self titled album features 10 brutal tracks and a guest appearance from Eric Rutan. Uh, there are signed CDs, wall flags, hoodies, and uh, they even have cassettes available. Uh, vinyls will be available later this summer because all vinyls backlog pretty deep. Um, if you use the code Dukes at checkout, you save 10% on your order at martyrstore.net. And remember to always respect the neck. Also, Crowbar has an album coming out, uh, Zero and Below. 
and it's only available at uh, martyrstore.net. You can pre-order it there and uh, get it when it comes out. Um, and uh, the new the new George Cannibal Corpse shit, uh, you know, it's just called Corpse Grinder. And uh, if you like heavy music, man, it's fucking heavy. It's it's fucking it. Production's killer. The songwriting is killer. The, his vocals are badass. The song um, Acid Vat's really fucking cool. Um, anyway, it's a really good record. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's when and I got this book today. Um, it's my new book I'm going to read. It's, so Quentin Tarantino is going to stop me. He's making one more movie and then that's it. Which, uh, I find a real bummer. I mean, uh, Quentin's one of my favorite directors. Uh, his movies, every single one of them is a, a moment in time that is just, it's kind of like getting a tattoo, man. You remember where you saw it. You remember what was going on. It has like this place and history in your mind and, and everything. And, you know, um, that scene in Hateful Eight when, uh, when, <laughs> when he makes him suck his dick for the blanket and he says, he's telling the father, he's like, hey, nobody has been as cold as your boy was that day. And then on top of it, at the end, he goes, you know, I never did give him that blanket. Dude, holy fuck. I think I might have, like, peed just a little bit laughing so fucking hard when that fucking happened. And it was it was a dark fucking scene. And I remember just laughing. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to dive into this book. Um, so we wrote a book, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I, I hope that he, he goes a little more deep into the characters, a little bit. I mean, he does a ex really ex exceptional job uh, when he's uh, in his films, and I, I hope that he, you know, is a, I know he's a good writer. If he's not going to do films anymore, I hope he becomes the new Stephen King and puts out a book like every 18 days. I think Stephen King has like uh, 6 million books at this point. What else happened this week? So we had the Super Bowl. Hockey starts tonight. Right? Right? Well, the only team that I give a fuck about is the New York Rangers, so they they play tonight. Uh, I'm only going to get to watch half of it because, check this out. I wake up last week. I get a fucking email early in the morning. I wake up, get my coffee, you know, fucking go out, sit on the porch, watch the sun come up, and boom, I click on my email. Hey, do you want to go see Louis C.K.? I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to see Louis C.K. But I'm thinking, oh, it's probably like $300 tickets, probably next July or something. No, no, you can see him next week for 20 bucks. And I went, click, and I fucking... So I'm on my way today to go see Louis C.K. Uh, do... I'm going to see him two nights in a row. I bought tickets for both nights. Um, bringing Melody with me. Say hi, Melody. Hey. Um... We're going to go see Louis C.K. Uh, he's going to do, like, he's so he's doing, um, it's uh, work for his next special. So it's going to be stuff he's going to be just trying out. And uh, I'm so fucking excited. So um, uh, I, I am going to heckle him at some point. <laughs> Uh, no, I, so let me, let me let me set the ground rules. If you go to comedy, which I go to comedy all the time, I went and saw Tim Dillon the other night. He was fucking awesome. His podcast is killer, um, and uh, Tim Dillon was re he was he was really funny. And uh, the the etiquette is uh, if you go to a comedy club, don't ever under any circumstances talk to the comedian unless he asks you a direct question. Don't speak your mind. You know what? It's better if you just don't breathe. Just sit there and just, you know what it is? Eat a, eat a big old pot cookie right before you go so you're too fucking terrified to fucking say anything. <laughs> fucking alcohol is the big worst ruiner of fucking... I went to the... So we went to Tim Dillon the other night, right? And we're sitting there and I see uh, um, Andy Warhol sitting at the bar by itself. It really wasn't Andy Warhol. It was a woman in a leather jacket with an Andy Warhol haircut. And she's eating a salad and drinking a beer. And then she ordered a glass of wine. So she had a beer and a wine. And uh, uh, she started talking to the people next to her. 
And uh, she's like, Tim Dillon, Tim Dillon, Tim Dillon, Tim Dillon, Tim Dillon. And it was like, holy shit, she's going to she's gonna get drunk and ruin this show for sure. And she's just pounding him. Some dude sitting at the bar randomly by himself, uh, she says, hey, my, my date never showed up. Do you want to go with me to this show? So random. So, so this guy had to sit with her for three hours. A woman he's never met in his life. She was really... Annoying. No, I mean not annoying and like she was she was half Karen, half something else. I don't know. Anyway, we watched this take place. It was it was pretty entertaining. It was just, it was more entertaining than the first comedian that came out. He wasn't bad, but this was more entertaining than that. Um, I watched her. I, I for some reason I kept out of the corner of my eye because I could see her in my view of the show and uh she wanted so badly to to scream out i saw she, i saw her walk in she was fucking stumbling anyway she, nobody said anything cuz T- i think tim would have just lit them up anyway um anyway tim was really good and uh enough of that anyway my guest this week fucking zetro so if you guys are watching this, I think you pretty much saw, or maybe you didn't. I don't know. Maybe you didn't see. Me and Zet sat down for like five hours, and he put out like a two two hour episode uh, on on his show, and um, so I had Zetro come on mine, and I really shot away from any of the questions that he asked me. So we kind of went on a different path. I asked him a lot about motorcycles and growing up, and um, you know, just just I tried to shy away from from some of the stuff we did. It, inherently it's going to go there because that's where it goes but we did talk about some other stuff we talked about some having like difficulties on stage difficulties you know singing in certain songs um and we talked about a bunch of shit and it was really cool and uh all right have a great week man i'll see you guys next week enjoy my podcast with steve zetro souza and there we are what's up dude how are you i'm good how are you <laughs> <laughs> yeah your record's great thank How? you we got i'm telling you the next time i talk to holt I'm yeah gonna push that have my kids open the show you guys support and then we play and then like two-thirds of the way in i fucking leave the stage and you come out for two do icono or mm-hmm. children are worth a sky something fucking fans would they would line around the fucking corners to see this you look what yeah man i mean your episode on my vault did like it blew everybody lars frederickson calls me he goes because he had the most views at one point and he goes how am i doing i go you got sorry bro rob dukes took you out by about eight (laughs) thousand viewers it was but i just have to say you and i left no stones unturned no man no, I just had a three-hour conversation with Lars, man. It was killer, and and uh, when when I and I used yours as a model to like kind of pick apart the past. I used that the conversation we had as how I've been doing this podcast and just kind of setting up, uh, you know, a, what what I think the fans want to hear, and then and then and then that usually turns into just a regular conversation. You know what I mean? I agree, because to me, that's I, I always say. Well, I'm interviewing, but I don't necessarily call it an interview. I do ask questions during it, but I try to keep a conversation up about, man, what if you were in the fly in the fucking room with Jimmy Page and Robert Plant one time and just got to sit there? Yeah, yeah. How how fucking cool would that? Because, I mean, to me, Zeppelin was my first. I was eight years old. My dad bought me, you know, Led Zeppelin four, and I was hard rock forever, and it's 1972 and this whole thing. And I'm thinking, God, I had these guys plastered all over my wall. What if one of them just looked at me and waved walking off the bus? I would be like, oh my God, you know? And yeah. now we've created that with our fan base. But to me, it would just be like, man, how cool would it be to be the fly on the wall with these two guys talking about shit? Yeah. You know what I mean? you know, so what was, the, what was the first record you, you bought with your own money? The first record I bought with my own money. Like, was, for like, I think it was um, Let It Be. 
I had a 45 of Let It Be when it came out. Remember the mm. Beatles last Yeah, week? yeah, yeah. Because my father was a biker, so I got to, I was exposed to listening to, you know, um, you know Black Sabbath and, and, and the Allman Brothers, and he was a biker, so he listened to yeah. the that sort of thing, and obviously Led Zeppelin, and then I, I, I so I, I knew who the Beatles were, so I remember having money, and I went down to the record store, and I think my brother bought, um, he bought a record, and I bought a record. He bought ABC by Michael Jackson, or the Jackson 5, ABC, and yeah. I bought Let It Be by the Beatles, and that was the first record, but I would say the first real record was, I was up for my eighth birthday, my dad bought me um, the eight track of Led Zeppelin four. And so yeah, that, right in the middle of stairway to heaven, it skipped to the other track. Was that or Misty mountain hop? No, it was, it was fucking stairway to heaven. I had the eight track of it and it used to skip right in the middle of the song. It would go click and it would have to click to the fourth track. Cause it wasn't enough fucking space. You remember it would back the song up 15 seconds. Or yeah. So. You got fucking a little bit of what right before just so you could get right. It was the cunts. worst ever. It was a and cunts, man. What a bunch of douchebags to design I, that system. I just, uh, unbelievable. But I remember that was my first, because my dad had, God, I remember, Stereophonics. It was that eight track in his fucking truck. Yeah. Just stereophonics and put that jam it in there. And that's where I got to listen. To I had the little plunger one. Remember the one that would look like a plunger? And you had What's to call that, that the dynamite eight. Remember? I don't remember the name. I just knew that it was yellow and it had fucking chunk. Yeah. Remember JJ from Good Times? He was the one who pitched it because I got the cassette version. Ah. Panasonic. Panasonic huh. Because I, I was got into cassettes so quickly after eight tracks pissed me off because that wasn't the only record that it did that. I did on all of them, yeah. I, I had a couple of other ones that were just like, man, it just, to me, it just, you're just taking the mood of the song waiting for the <laughs> change. It ruined it. So, yeah. I, and then I found out there was another thing called a cassette. And then I went to that. And that's basically what I listened to all my, that and records, obviously records. Because yeah. I, that's, I, I mean, yeah. When I was stealing, I had records, but then, you had this mobile thing that you could take outside, which was the plunger. That's the one I had that was the first. And then I got the boom box. But um, so let me ask you a question. Where did, where did you grow up and how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have, uh, I grew up in Dublin, California, you know, like along with, I mean, you know, Chuck Billy, him and I, we grew up together. Uh, Phil Demo from Machine Head and Violence. We all grew up Troy Lakata from Tesla. It was funny that this tiny little town about uh, 15 minutes southeast of Oakland had, you know, these rocker guys in it. But I had one brother. I have a bro I have one. I have one brother. He lives right. in San Diego. He played bass in like hair metal bands in the 80s, but wasn't really a thrasher kind of, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, um, nothing, nothing over over the top. We felt that the town that we grew in was kind of small and obscure from like what was going on out in Berkeley and San right. Francisco. Because we had to drive 40 minutes from where Dublin was to get out to Oakland or to Berkeley or the San Pablo, the area where like the Metallica house was, where uh, Lars and James lived. They lived in San Pablo. Gary was from Richmond. Uh, a lot of guys in Las Rocket were from Berkeley, you know. So we drove out to there. Right. And it was a lot of us that did that, you know, kind of the group, you know. We you, were kind of, you you know, know. So, so your dad was a biker. So what was, what was it? You grew up in, uh, did you grow up in that, um, like, uh, that typical crazy biker household where it was just partying around you or was it, no. or was, did he do that somewhere else? That was done somewhere else, but still very strict biker, um, uh, bring, you know, like his friends were all, you know, members and, and, and his right. friends were all in the houses and, and then they were all, you know. I didn't know it. I didn't know. I mean, you know, I knew who people were. I knew who Sonny Barger was when I was five years old, you know, right. so that was the kind of the house that I grew up in. Okay. There was Harley in the garage or four, you know, um, I remember my brother wanted to buy a dirt bike and it was a Honda. <laughs> my old man, he wouldn't let us, he wouldn't even let us own Japanese cars. 
We had to own American cars. It was like, nope, you ain't parking that Jap piece of shit in my garage. And that was what he said. And I was right. like, holy shit. And it's like, you know, no way. You, you want to fucking go get a Harley? He's like, but dad, they don't make dirt bikes. He's like, they make a sprint. It's a street bike, though. Yeah. So we, my brother, when we, our first motorcycles were Harley Davidson sprints, only because huh. every all the rest of our friends had fucking, you know, the RD 400s and, you know, the fast bikes. And we had to, well, we'll, we'll see you when we get there because we had sprints. <laughs> that AF made these bikes. They were like little 250 and 350 things. But the old man, my first car was a Pontiac Bonneville, 67 Pontiac Bonneville. And that was all because he's like, I got to know a guy who's got a car for sale. You're, you're going to buy this car. It was like, you know, you know, and I was, you know, looking at other kind of sportier Japanese cars. He was like, yeah, where are you going to park it? He parked it in front of my house, pal. Yeah. So I had to, or, and Chevy, he was big into Chevy. He had a Chevy Stepside, had a 73 Stingray Corvette. You know what I mean? He was all about that whole thing. America. What about, what about Volkswagen and German cars? Are you all right with that? No, he didn't. You know what? He didn't. I had a Volkswagen in the late eighties. Yeah. On it then, but he was just like Budweiser beer, you know, fucking right. Chevrolet, Harley Davidson motorcycles, yeah. America, love it or leave it. You know, yeah. the typical biker on the, on Friday, he came home from work. He worked a job, a blind mechanic. As in, like, um, he worked as a bottler. And on okay. Friday night, he would come home, and we would hear that fucking panhead, brown, take off, come home late Saturday, Friday night, and then leave early Saturday morning, and we'd see him probably Sunday afternoon. That was yeah. it. That, that was his life. That's what he did. Everything yeah. was a motorcycle. Everything was about, um, you know, biking and, and, and driving, going, hanging out with the fellas, and, and being that. I, I There would be times, because my brother and I were very – active in sports we played every sport every year what else did were you supposed to yeah. do is Dublin, right so and it was rare like kids on my team would go i'd all of a sudden i'd hear the bike and people would be like Souza sounds like your old man <laughs> so, um, nobody in 1974 rode a fucking harley davidson yeah you know, they just didn't you know you were a biker or if you rode a harley you were a biker and then he would come and he would walk to the outfield and keep his hands crossed over the fence like this watch and then if it was a seven inning game sixth inning he'd bolt and i'd hear yeah. but for the end of the game i'd hear the motorcycle uh still fire up and he'd split never yeah. stayed for the after the game never sat with the other parents it was it was just kind of that was his thing he was an introvert was, but his yeah. thing, old school biker he had his friends he had his ways and, you know, we had our life and he had his, and that was the way it was. You know that, Rob, you're the same yeah. age now the parents were back then. They always talk about the 70s me generation. I agree with that 100%. My yeah. parents cared about what my parents were doing, not about what Stephen and John were doing, that's for sure. Yeah. Did you, um? so did you, at home with your brother, so you and your brother spent a lot of time together, did, were you like reading into books at this point, or are you just diving into music deep? What kind of student were you? Were you a, a decent student? Were you I never had to go to continuation. In fact, when I joined Exodus in 86, I ruined their perfect string of no uh, graduates because Robbie, Rick, Tom, Gary, and Bailoff never graduated from high school. So, yeah. but I, 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 uh, I, I didn't have a problem with school. I knew how to do things. Like I could, I, I knew how to think about it. It's like, okay, I, I knew how to study. That's hard to teach a kid how to do. Yeah how to study and i knew how to retain information and so we talk about that all the time i remember the lyrics like i always remember them they yeah just, that's fucking weird they always said uh you know they always you know it, uh, gary told me oh, zet never forgot words and i'm like well i'm not zet and i don't remember shit so fucking whatever <laughs> I know a lot of singers do i know you know rob halford and and, and chuck billy they use teleprompters i think yeah. just do and and that's fine because there's a lot of material there. I just seem to retain the information, and yeah. I can, if I if I'm interested in it, I'll remember it. I'll remember yeah. it. So I didn't have a problem with that. So school was 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 easy. It was just school was to get through to get to this. If I could get to this, yeah. I, that was was the catalyst. I didn't go to my proms. 
I didn't go to um, any of that stuff. I remember I was at a gig the night that uh, I had my senior ball. And yeah. so, and, and, you know, for what it's worth, at least, you know, it worked out for me, you know what I mean? Kind of, yeah. you know, the hard work and missing things like that, that you look back on and go, wow, you know, I probably should have fucking went to that. You know what I mean? But I was like, fuck that. That music ain't happy. They're going to go there and play dance music. Fuck that. I would have banged my head, man. So yeah. that's kind of the way. Well, we also, going. we had to have the tennis rackets and we had to be able to, we had to practice our moves and, and get ready to be in a band. You know what I mean? Hey, I was that guy in my room. Me too. I, my bed was the uh, was the was the crowd, and mm. I was the my room. And I put records on, and I would like I remember, I would do unleashed in the from top to bottom. I, I one day I would be KK, one day I would be Tipton, and I always would drop the thing and be Halford on the cool parts, and then pick it, pick the guitar back up. But I. I feel that's a lot of my stage presence comes from that practice. <laughs> I am serious because I dreamed it and I really wanted it really bad. And I really, I, I'm, you know, I'm really fortunate because, you know, everybody in the world dreams as dreams and, you know, not all of them get fulfilled, you know, and I feel in yeah. my life very fortunate to have my dreams as a child fulfilled. And when I see, kids from sixth grade or fifth grade that I've seen. I did an ACDC show last month and four kids from my elementary school happened to show up and I didn't even know they were coming. And huh. it was, every one of them said, we knew back then that you were going to be doing this. We knew that. And I was yeah. like, wow. that's kind of a trip to hear that from kids that knew me when I was fucking 10 years old, fucking yeah. nine. I didn't know they were coming. I didn't really keep in touch. I think they saw it on a flyer and just saw that Zetro from Exodus and Tribute Bands playing and they showed up and it was really, I was so excited. I actually recognized one of them when I was on stage and I was like, no way. And then I recognized another one and I got so excited, you know, even though there's, you know, there's fans that come every show and support it. And I think that that's great. I was just so like, wow, these guys knew me when this whole shit was, but I was just Steve Souza, you know what I mean? Right. Any of this role. So yeah. I, I kind of got a kick out of that. At the 57 years old now, I kind of got a little kick out of that, you know? So it's- uh, I don't, You know, I, I don't know, what does Zetro come from? I don't know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, 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 was, uh, I was taking acid when I was uh, 14. And I walked down the street with this guy. I remember Keith Newport and me and him were just frying. And I didn't, um, we weren't saying anything. I don't know if you've ever taken acid before. It could do things like- Oh, about 500 times. Well, yeah, well, okay, so you know, you won't, you could just trip on lights and not say nothing. So we're walking down the street after sitting at a stoplight for six hours, watching it fucking change. And that, that was the great, the trails. <laughs> I wonder what the fucking cops were thinking while we were sitting there. Uh, they kept passing by. We didn't even think twice of it. So I'm walking down the street, and all of a sudden, I look at him, and I go, Zet. And he looks at me, and he goes, Zet. And I go, Zet. And he goes, Zet again. And we just start busting up laughing. So we're actually walking to a kegger party. And I get to this kegger party, and I got, like, a beer that I've been nursing for, like, five hours, sitting in a corner. And every time somebody goes up, hey, Susan, what's up? I was like, Zet, Zet. So that was a Friday night, weekend went by, roll around Monday morning, I come to school and it's, um, and I go to the smoking section, obviously where all my friends are. And uh, they're like, what's up, dude? You were frying so fucking hard. What's up, Zet? Hey, Zet. And it just seemed to stick from huh. there. About three years later, a good friend of um, mine and uh, Chuck Billy's, Jim Christensen, you might have met him. He goes on the road with Testament every once in a while. And yeah, he, I know. Yeah, I've met him. Yeah. He, uh, he put the tro on it. I was, oh. I was and somebody, go get that, that tro. And I think he meant to say Jethro because Mike from, <laughs> Mike from Suicidal, anytime he sees me and he knows it's Zetro, he just does it for Jethro. How you doing, Jethro? 
and I'm, I'm cool with that. From you, yeah. brother, I'm cool with that. So that's kind of where that came from. And it just stuck. And then when you join a band like Axel or Slash or Izzy or Zetro or Nikki or whoever, you know, it's like it's they they're attracted to that nickname, you know. So yeah. there's a lot of people that think that have said Zetro, are your parents hippies? I'm like, uh. why? <laughs> well, a name like Zetro, I'm like, yeah, my real <laughs> That's some LSD. <laughs> but yeah no but my dad was a biker but not a hippie believe me huh. a little bit more intense than a fucking hippie so yeah was, so when it, when uh when did you start watching uh horror movies and early uh early old three years old my mother put on dark shadows that's my favorite thing in the world my house is decorated in dark shadows i have you know jonathan frit autograph in my bathroom i have all the i have all the episodes on dvd uh, they, that ran at 3 30 on uh, abc every day it was i don't know if you remember it was a soap nope. opera no dark shadows and the main character was uh barnabas collins the vampire and they hmm. had witches and warlocks and werewolves and stuff so that's where i got introduced to it and then by the time i was probably about five or six there was a weekly show that came on i'm actually wearing it right there creature i remember creature features yeah i remember that came on and bob wilkins came on every friday saturday or friday and saturday and you know you know television back then rob you had 13 channels yeah and you horror movies like i could go turn on my fucking channel right tv right now and give you 40 different outlets of every horror type of genre you could think of that wasn't that yeah. when i was eight fucking years old so yeah it was creature features in any horror movie that was on tv i would take the tv guide when my mother bought it on a friday and scan through every day until i saw the word thriller when I knew it, they never called it horror back then. It was a thriller. So track thriller, and I would circle it if I happened to be there in anything. Godzilla versus the Smog Monster, I'd circle it because it one of my great, that's one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm telling you. So it's it, not it, on, you know, I go through, uh, I was watching, I was going through either Amazon or Netflix, and they have a ton of Godzilla movies. And that one's not in there. For some reason, that movie is really hard to uh, obtain. Um, Network shows it. In fact, on New Year's Eve, or New Year's just a couple of weeks ago, they do the, uh, like, 24 hours of, yeah, yeah. of, of um, um, Godzilla. And so it's, it's I, I, I watched all, all of them were on there. Yeah. I love of it. I love it. So that's what I did. I, I okay. scanned the, the book. I, I, and then obviously Halloween week was huge because they would show horror movies. So I would be stuck there, but basically, and then anything that came to the movies from anything from Empire of the Ants to fucking, uh, you know, uh, uh, Godzilla versus Megalon, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, you know, any of these movies that were like, had some sort of kind of horror-esque or fantasy or something cool, cool creature. Always had right. to have a creature. And it, I was, I was sold. I was on. Were you? Was did you read? Did you ever read like Faust or Eerie or Creep Show or any of the old uh, horror magazines and comic books? Because I, I personally, I didn't. I wasn't. Uh, TV wasn't really huge in my life. I, I, it was more books. So that's where I kind of gravitated to. So I was reading those comics when I was way too early. I, I was way too young to be reading shit like that, but I was reading it. Now I did read um, of the comic books that I did read. I read a little bit of the of the Marvel characters, but they were Werewolf by Night, Man. Oh thing, yeah, the movie. And but I did read. Um, if it's midnight, it's the Witching Hour, and I had Tales from the Crypt, and I had oh. a, a subscription to Fangoria magazine, and yeah. so I, 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 I uh, uh, Frankenstein Rungs a Monk, um, the Tomb of Dracula. All of that stuff, I, I I was very much into the horror comics. Although I did like, I mean, I'd go off and buy a little Lulu or a Richie Rich every once in a while because yeah. I liked, you know, and I'd buy a, a Hulk or 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 a Human Torch. But my favorites were a Swamp Thing, um, Werewolf by Night. Um, um, if it's midnight, it's a witching hour because it had all like the uh, uh, tales uh, tales from the crypt, 
Tales of Terror, any of those, um, you know, from um, from beyond or, or any of those, to, you know, Tales from the Grave. I, I love them. I love my them. first. My first tattoo was the there was the cover of Gore Shriek number one. Like if you ever seen, it's a guy ripping his face off. Yeah, that was that was my first tattoo because um, I was obsessed with uh, Gore Shriek and the, and the comics like Faust and and Eerie and the, they had all these really great you know comics and they were super dark and it wasn't just uh, they would read it led to stories so I, I read a lot of Stephen King and I was reading uh, just a lot of you know I read a lot so it was kind of and, and I didn't get into the movie thing until later it was a, a later thing and. Uh, but I know when I went to your house, your house was all fucking horror and it was killer. And I'm like, oh, this. And, uh, you know, we had a good conversation about that. So, my yeah, fucking uh, cat is driving me crazy. Look at this. Well, my fucking... dogs are all walking around here. Yeah. Why Look at this thing. Show. Hi, baby. How cute. Yeah. I have a my pugs are all fucking wandering around me right now. Like, what's that? <laughs> she's, jumping on... <laughs> she's distracting me. So, anyway. Um, all right. So, Horror, metal, music, right? And then, so how old, were, how old were when you got your first Harley? Well, I guess I was what? I was 15 and a half because that would have been the sprint. It was a street bike. Okay, yeah. I was 15 and a half. And then, um, but I, I remember, I mean, I always, I always rode them. I didn't have to buy them because my dad had three or four in the garage. So my first runs, <clears throat> I was probably going on runs. Red would run. I went in 77 or 78 on the back of his shovel head. I was 14 or 13 going on oh. hard, actual fucking runs. Right. With, and then I would get up there and he'd be like drinking with the bikers. You go, hey, you want to go take a rip on the bike? Go rip it up and down the street. I'm all, but I don't have a license. He's like, there's no cops here. <laughs> so I'd, get <laughs> I'd be out with the bikers and fucking riding them. Hey, kid, I'd have to kick the fucking thing over because. He always bought those old school shovel heads and stuff where they didn't have electric start on them. So yeah. I, I had to kick a motorcycle over when I was doing that. But I mean, I, I and it's always been in my blood. It's always been in my, my life. Let me type it away. I, I, <laughs> I've always been, you know, it's always, my house was decorated when I was a kid in complete Harley Davidson. There was nothing on the walls. No pictures of me and my brother. Right. <laughs> the Harleys he built and pictures of, you know, ride the American dream, the fucking number one mirror that was there, the wing. Yeah. That's how it was. So I, you know, it's always been, it's just, just like you, always been in my blood, man. Yeah. I went the other way though. I, I, uh, I was a sport bike demon. So I got, I was started in dirt bikes with the, with the Suzuki and then the Honda CR series and the RM through Suzuki. And then I went, uh, I got into street bikes in my, when I was about 19. Um, and then I, uh, and then I got into like Moto GP race, like doing like the, the Yamaha, the, the one thousands. And then I got into all the, all the bikes I bought that I really love were all V twin. So the V twin sport bikes made by Honda. Um, I had the RC 51 and the, uh, the 996 super Hawk and the ST 1000 there. So those were all, super fast big crazy loud bikes but i also had the yamaha v max remember that fucking thing yeah, I do. I do. 1200 i had one of those for about 10 years that's that was like my main vote of transportation even in the winter dude in new york man and it was cold as fuck on that thing but uh, yeah man but um crazy i mean I'm, it's i'm in california and it's like 50 <laughs> i got on my fucking scooter yesterday to take a ride and i was like i went like fuck, i only had to go one town over i was fucking i'm a I'm freezing and it's 53 degrees. And then yeah. I talked to a friend of mine in Bergen, Norway, and it's just cold. He's all, man, I envy you guys have riding weather. Year like, round. I'm all, yeah. yeah, riding weather. I'm such a pussy. I won't go out of it. <laughs> what's, the, what's the longest trip you've ever, ever done? Like in one, like sitting, like, like, so like, I, you know me, I've ridden across the country like eight times on different, different I trips. I've so never done that. The longest I've gone on a roll is like a, like from an eight hour roll from one point to another. I went from here to San Diego. Oh, okay. All right. Came back, but it's not, it's like, you know, I, I'm around here. Uh, and then every time I, Sturgis, 
goes, something happens with this that I can't go. So, right. you know what I mean? I, I want to play Sturgis one year so I get to go, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> a couple of bikes there. I got friends there. So I know I'd have a bike to ride. So, yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, you're, you and like Ricky Rackman, he's another one that's a fucking trooper. He goes from coast to coast to coast to coast and does all kinds of these charity rides, man. And uh, yeah. does really well with them. Fucking he's, he does it like every year he does it, you know? And I mean, that's insane. He's got actually Indian sets him up with a really, really nice bike, but it's just, it's insane. Yeah. I started hanging out with the East Bay rack guys, uh, John Furpo and those guys. So when I, when I started, when I was in the band, I would, I rode my bike from New York to San Francisco and I'd leave it in Lee's garage. So I'd have it to ride around and I'd go hang out with the East Bay rack guys. And, um, when they were nuts, man, they were, they would like go find cops to have them chase them on purpose and shit like that. It was fucking crazy. And, yeah. um, we do the, was it Berryessa? Is that a, uh, up in the river, uh, Russian river? <laughs> So we would ride up to Berryessa and then fucking ride all fucking day long in the back roads there and then get back on the fucking five or the one on one and just fucking hammer it like 120 miles an hour and not give a fuck about the cops or nothing. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm lucky I didn't lose my license because I we did some crazy shit, but um, I don't ride like that anymore, man. I'm like, I'm old now, dude. I just I fucking I want to I want to cruise and, and uh, I do like taking long trips, though. I love nothing better than we talked about you and I filming like you and i going on like a long trip like doing like like uh like utah or something like that and go to all the fucking national parks which would be fucking killer i think we should do that i think it would be interesting for us to do that Fuck, i can do it i know my dino would make it for sure yeah yeah man i got the new i have the fjr 1300 now the yamaha with like heated seats and grips Motor and shit <laughs> that is a great motorcycle dude it's got the little plug in for like if you buy this suit that goes with it so you can be I, warm <laughs> i bought i bought a uh, battery operated gloves that's me yeah. that's my that's my technology on my dyno <laughs> battery operated gloves which i love to death uh, i, I yeah. thought i got i can't believe i've ridden i got him i was like oh my god oh. I, where were these my whole life? <laughs> my whole life. You know what I love is cruise control, dude. Just to hit the button and go. Well, oh, I don't have to fucking do this. Like, God, you got to get, get that, that pain control. right here. The pain right there from holding the throttle for fucking hours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah, know. man. No, we should do. It. We should definitely do that. And uh, I remember wanting to follow the tour bus on. Um, with my bike i wanted to like ride from gig to gig and then whenever i didn't i could just find room in the trailer but there was never room in the trailer but i know that fletcher from pennywise does that they bring they bring their harleys and they it's like so they were in texas or they were uh in new orleans and they rode from like texas to new orleans like him and two other guys and all their equipment is in the front of the trailer all packed up and then the bikes are on the back and uh and they get to like oh, that's they a do cool way to do it that's a yeah cool man and then when nights they don't want to, or if the weather's bad, they just put it in the trailer and ride in the bus. You know what I mean? So, Chuck Billy made a, a rack for his his when he was he had his uh, he had that big uh, FLH that yeah. big, you know, uh, I think he had a, a Road King big old you know bagger and um, they made a case for him, but I heard he never pulled it out. It's like shit. I if we tour together, we'll bring our bikes and we'll do little trips. We'll do oh, something I'll fucking cool. I'll bike to come with me so I don't have to worry about this. Oh, well, they scratched it. I just borrowed it. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Talk about that. Tour together. You have an amazing new record out, so why don't we... Uh, what do you guys do? I know. So let's... I, I would say, like I said, let's get my kids' band, Hatriot, to open. Yeah. Kill Exodus. And then all the Exodus, all the Exodus fans get to see Rob come out, and I'll leave the fucking yeah, man. stage. It's not like a... It's not Exodus. It's not I like would, it wouldn't do well. I think the the fans would love eat that up as much as they like to see you and I talk together or on stuff like that. Could you imagine they get to see you play with your band, then they get to see us go up do X, and they get to see you both versions. Of yeah, it, you know what I mean. And and fuck it, every it's a win 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 on every account. Win for us, wins for the fans. Absolutely, and, and they'd want to see it. So now fans like. Who's ever listening to this or watching this? You must 
Go to Gary Holt's Instagram. <laughs> just fucking, <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, you need to talk to I'll Gary, take, man, because me and Zed are already in, dude. I'll take, I'll take the heat. Bob's packing me on this. And go to Gary Holtz and, and say that we just saw an interview with Zetro and Dukes today, and they said that <laughs> they want, they would love to go out of Exodus and Generation Killed. So we're coming to you because you're the final word on it. What do you think? Yeah. Look. Well, let's stay on our boy. Let's get on All our right. boy. I know that he just did your he just did your uh, your podcast as well. Yeah, it was great. It was killer. Yeah. Great, he's great. He's yeah. the real deal. You know that, Rob. He yeah. is the real deal. He is the real deal, and he's also in fucking sane. He's a crazy person. You know that, right? He's a. Crazy <laughs> I was twenty two. I'm being yanked since I was twenty two. I love him to death, but he's insane. Um, so let me ask you, man. So, uh, what was the worst? gig you ever played personally personally like for like you like for you yeah like awful just shitty yeah um i was just talking about this the other day my son went uh patriot did this little thing last weekend and on friday night he thought he could have some drinks before the show and he Mm -hmm. found out that what it's like when you go up there and you're fucking drunk and he just doesn't have to sing. He has to play bass. Well, mine was, I remember we were on Headbangers Ball Tour. And um, I was in, um, we were in New Orleans. And um, I love Slurpees. Not as much anymore because my transformation lately, but I love Slurpees. And we got to the French Quarter and hurricanes are like Slurpees with fucking alcohol in them. So I was drinking them and I didn't really taste the booze, but I guess, and they are heavily fucking highly yeah. all you know content to drinks and uh i drank like five of them and on those tour on those tours we were on stage like at 7 30 or something like eight o'clock it was an arena tour so it started early halloween went on then us so we were 7 30 and i went on stage <clears throat> and i was i had to be the worst because I was so fucking shit faced, I couldn't even remember the words, and I was spinning, and it was just awful. Again, Gary was no, none too happy with me. Yeah. So, Do you remember was, what city it was? Do you remember what city? It was New Orleans. Oh, New Orleans. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you said that. Yeah. Was big in hurricanes. You know. Yeah. We've been, okay. When the show started. I never been to the French Quarter before. So our manager was there with us, Tony, and she's all, oh, let's take a cab and go. So we took a drink, and I'm walking around. I'm like, wait a minute. They got drink places right on the street? I'm all, fuck me. Hey, yeah, I'm all, so um, what, what do you got that kind of tastes like a Slurpee? They're all, oh, they have a hurricane. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And I'm all, it does taste like a Slurpee. <laughs> After five of those, five of them, and, and now if I drank, a half a one I'd be throwing up, let alone five of them. But yeah. I was 26 at that time, and we did do party back in those days. So it's not saying my body wasn't like an athlete physically ready for it, but yeah. um, I that was probably the worst time on stage. Although I'll say, and not to be arrogant, I try not to ever have bad shows, regardless of how much I need to prepare myself for it like i did this thing two or three years ago called hail and it was myself and um chris adler and james lomenzo and phil demo and we just went and played 22 cover songs in dubai and in uh, saudi arabia and uh it was songs that i had heard many times before but not really knew exactly what they were saying in the songs and it took me four months to to where I could sing those 22 songs comfortably to where I knew them in my head all the way through like that. It took me that much time to right. get that. So it was like, you know, I I, I have to I, I I have to know everything that I'm I'm so much a student of that. I try not to have bad shows. I'm prepared. Every night I go out there going, you know, I'm having a great show tonight. I don't care. I don't care. I was tired nights we walk up and maybe the other four will go. Didn't have too good of a show tonight. About really, I was great. I felt great. <laughs> Even the vibe, and I, I don't care if there's eight people in the crowd or eighty thousand. I try to give it up, give it my all. You what know, was the so best show you ever did? One, one is there one that sticks out? 
I think the best one ever will would would be probably it was the biggest crowd I'd ever seen at the time when we played a Dynamo Festival in '88. I'd mm. never seen twenty five thousand people in a crowd, and we were the headliner. And yeah. so I in Rio. So I mean, they've all been very special. And when I've been very fortunate to play all the major festivals, like yourself, you know what I mean, being able to put yeah. that on resume. But I think Dynamo '88, that very first one, walking out on that stage and just seeing a soccer field full of people that knew all of the music that was so i i played bigger ones you know but I yeah think that one always sticks out with me and also the warfield with mod when they busted all the seats in the front and they ended up renovating the warfield because of that because this warfield until exodus played in 88 seats went all the way down to the front and then huh. we seven rows of seats got torn out so Bill Graham, who kind of owned it, managed it, decided to renovate it after. Yes. And people were jumping from the second floor. I got actually have the, I put it on my wall in my garage. I found the, the article from the paper that said people, fans were leaping from the second floor balcony to get to the floor to, to, to get in the pit. That one had, picture of Toby Rage, like above oh, the crowd. I love that photo. Yeah. He was best at it. He was yeah best at it fucking never- headwalker yeah <laughs> so well and it was just i mean i mean he was a legend he sees a legend he still is yeah. a legend it was characters like that rob that made the scene it wasn't necessarily the bands it was the andy anderson's it was the toby rages you know yeah. I mean? it was the people like that the guys that hung around bailoff you know what i mean just yeah <laughs> the slave team <laughs> So you're new on your on your new album, man. You uh, you guys, uh, it's it's fucking killer, dude. Your your new shit is fucking. Dude, I mean, Lunatic Liar Lord is my favorite. Um, I think you you guys killed it. I liked that you use different uh, vocal stylings. Like you didn't you you didn't stay consistent through the whole thing one way. We discussed that before this went down. Uh, Gary and I had a conversation. This was probably ju- uh, June or July of 2020. And he says, hey, I need you to be better on this record. And I go, okay. He goes, you need to switch it up. You need to start. And I go, you know, it's funny you said that because I've been thinking about myself. I've actually been listening to a lot of Behemoth and a lot of Lamb of God. And he's all, good start. So when we went into recording it, I already had that idea of how to use it mm-hmm. or, or what I was going to do but let's try it but you do it subtly and that was Andy's idea Andy Sneep's right. idea we recorded more of the lower guttural vocal on some stuff and when it went into mix he wasn't oh, he was like you know what it's not what Zetro is but it's great because it really breaks it up so let's use that you know subtly and I and yeah. I think Gary and I mean, actually, I went back into the studio and did a couple of things differently. It all worked out that yeah. way. That was, well, was definitely it, the approach. It, it was definitely impressive, man. I mean, it was, uh, you know, the whole record from the, I mean, Tom is phenomenal. I mean, the lyrics are, I mean, fire. it's Exodus, man. The lyrics fire. are great. Fucking the guitar solos, uh, even having like Rick on there is fucking awesome. And and having Craigan come in and do a little thing. It was, um, it was a very good record. And, and, it's unfortunate that like you can't like that we you couldn't put something out and then immediately go on the road and fucking play it. It just sucks that this is the time we're in. But that being said, you guys did a couple videos and you uh, you were here. I re- I mean, I got to see you a couple months ago because you guys were here doing a video, but I, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I saw it last week. I don't know if they have released it. It's absolutely cool as fuck. Right. Really, I'll be one of the best videos I've ever seen of myself anyway, but I, I liked it just from what they did, what, what they were doing with the fire and this, and it came out and the song is really strong. It's got a great chorus in it. And that goes again, you know, we're talking about the strength of the record and everybody's performance was great, but I have to say it. I mean, not to sit here and suck his dick, but Rob, I wrote two songs lyrically on the record. Tom wrote one song lyrically yeah. on the record. It was brilliant, yeah. So one song musically, Gary Holt wrote the whole fuck. I mean, lunatic, yeah. all I am. And, oh. and 
it's and the middle part where I, you know, warring factions. That's his whole vision. And of <laughs> everything on the record that was a challenge for me, let's just say I had to sing that one a few different times. <laughs> I wasn't in the pocket as I needed to be, but lucky we had the time. But I have to give Gary, I mean, you know, he just comes off of 10 years, you know, filling in for legendary Jeff Hanneman. And I think this just goes to prove that he belonged there the whole fucking time because yeah. he's a real deal. Lyrically, musically, I mean, he produces the album as well. He's there for everything I sing. In fact, I refuse to sing. Yeah. All the I was in Laguna. He's like, we'll just run through this. And I'm like, where's Gary at? Oh, well, he'll be here. I'm up. Mm. Mm. We're wasting time if I do that. I ain't yeah. doing it. It's here because I'll do it. And he'll go, yeah, no, we need it. Exactly. I know this. I've been doing this since I was 22. I know right. how it is. So let's just, you know, wait till he's here, which I'm great with. I'd rather him be here. When I did Blood In, Blood Out, he was on in Europe with fucking a Slayer. So I basically were sending tracks. It was the first time I ever tracked a record where he was not on the other side of the glass, so to speak. Yeah. So, and I, I, I trust his a judgment. I know he has it in his head how he hears it. And I, I, I mean, it's hard to get a guy like, you know, that really has, you know, knows exactly what he wants from every aspect, drumming, bass, vocals, lyrics, leads, everything. So, you know, I'm very fortunate, yeah. fortunate to be, you know, know somebody, you know, and be able to play with somebody so talented, just so natural. Yeah, I like when we were doing the Generation Kill record, I, I uh, you know, they, I let the boys do their their shit. I let the drummer do his thing. I, everybody does their thing. And then when it comes to the vocals, I uh, I always hear it before it's done. And I, and it's like, it's like you hear it the way you want it and then you have to get there, you know? And sometimes it's really fucking tough, man. They're like, nope, I hear it this way, but but you can't sing that good. Well, you're going to have to fucking, fucking earn it. So, yeah. Well, that's the thing. When I'm going in with him, it's like, here's the guy who's hears it his way in his head. And I'm trying to channel that. You know what I mean? <laughs> how, I know how I hear it because there's been many times through, oh God, I remember the fabulous disaster argument for the songs because the song Fabulous Disaster comes. It stops on a seven, not on an eight. So yeah. when Stops. I have to anticipate that and go. When the da -da 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 yeah, I know, I know. Get that to whereas I was fucking. I must have been there all day that day going. And to whereas everybody was like, like, like a cheering section when I was supposed to come in. When the they were like, they'd be like, okay, is that right? <laughs> and I, when the like just a half a second off, and this is before you could move the shit. You know what I mean? You had yeah. fun. It was real to real I'm, I'm fucking singing to tape so and i was like i'm never gonna get this we could do it on the eight and it'll sound fine and he's like no it's got to be on the seven or it won't come in right and i'm like no it doesn't matter yes it does matter <laughs> and then he's right because dun, 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 dun. when the fist is out falling and so it all falls the way he heard that you know what yeah. i mean trying to argue with what you're hearing and it doesn't work like that but i've learned to grow I've learned to do that. That's why I know now. I, I was like, I, I, because I'll be like, I know what you're thinking. I've been doing this with you too long. Dude, you even like this. So, right. Even, even bonded by blood. The, the, there's a, no one, I, I don't know why I hear it a certain way, but bonded has a little extra note before you sing. Bonded. And right. So that first word, like, I think, I, I had, I struggled with it and it was our opener for a while and I struggled with it and no one got like, why are you fucking? And I'm like, look, you guys sing with a CD, right? You think it's all fucking easy, but get a band behind you with a fucking microphone and a monitor that you can't really hear everything you need to hear and all the other shit. And then we'll just see how quickly you can fucking do this job. Okay. It's ironic that you say that because when I first joined the band in 86, that was tough. So you know what I did? I hummed 
the mm. <laughs> air coming in. So that, and I just followed the air raid. And when yeah. I knew that the air raid dropped, then I went, but then I knew that's how I came in on that. I followed the, and, and they would look at me and go, what are you doing? And I'd be, do it in the mic. I mean, they'd like, pull your mic away if you're going to do the air raid. But that's what kept my, then I got it out of the line. <laughs> Yeah. I counted in my head, it would be one and two and one and black. You know what I mean? It was like a kind of like a, there was like a little, nobody saw, there's no timing thing there. I go, there is, just sing it live for real and then you'll get it. Yeah. He, so. he, there's a lot of other songs that is the same way. You know what I yeah. mean? Right. You know, like that War's My Shepherd's another one. You know what I mean? That last you know, far well, grand. Oh, the, yeah, 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 yeah. That last well, drumming thing. I, Riot I, I, Act. I, Death I, amphetamine. I, Jesus I, Christ, it's crazy. I wait for the splash. <laughs> I don't to the roll. I just wait. Goes, as soon as the splash, I'm I, I dive in. And that's and I right. and, and it's funny because you'll see me on stage and we're doing wars with my shepherd, and all of a sudden I'll back up my ass to his drum riser so i'm right on it so and I'll, <laughs> I'll sit there and act like i'm banging and all i'm i'm not he's going that drum and, and all i'm waiting for is that oh, well, God, I'm there, I'm there. <laughs> that's what i know i don't even care what he's doing there so. i said i used to jump on the riser and look right at tom and watch his do until he hit it and then i'd know and i'd jump off the riser at that point yeah fuck so, man and yeah i just wait for the i just yeah. wait to and if I can't hear of the splash from where I'm at, I scoop my fat ass up to the fucking <laughs> so I can hear that splash. And one time, he didn't do it, and he does that from time to time. He'll like he instead of splash, he did like boop boop like a little beat, and it threw me off. And I came in the dressing room later. I go, "Thank you for fucking up wars, my yeah. shepherd." And both staff but used to do that too. I go, you don't understand. I cue in on everything <laughs> you do. So I'm waiting for your little hoopa doodle scoopa scappa scappa spack it got. And then I come in. If you don't do the hoopa doodle scoopa doodle scappa 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 and do something else, then I'm lost. Do you understand? So yeah. stay with the same role. Is it that hard? It's a great role. I'm not, every, does everybody love the role? We love the role. What's the problem here? You know what I mean? So it's just kind of how I do it. But that wars my shepherd. I had to have him. I told you, you can never forget that that splash. That splash tells me start singing. And that's all I do. I don't even, I just put my head down. And I'm like, okay, splash is coming. Send. Turn out, turn out. Oh, well done. And then I find I'm right on. So, switching gears. Have you ever crashed your motorcycle? You ever been yeah. in an accident? What yeah. happened? Uh, came out of, uh, uh, did it twice, did it a couple of years ago. And then I did it again last year after I got it painted and had and didn't fuck my paint up, but my fairing I had to send my fairing back three months after I got it. Hmm. Um, knew I had a bald tire, and for you motorcycle riders out there, it is very serious. No but joke. It wasn't all that bald, but I, on my standards, the way I keep my motorcycle together and everything tip top, I I should have. I, I was getting it next week. I went to a, a motorcycle event. We were all leaving. I came around the corner and um, everybody hit it. You know what I mean? So I hit it and I hit gravel. And so uh. as soon as I hit it, my fucking rear end just came around and I did a 360. And I'm in the spin going, my fucking paint, my fucking paint, my fucking paint. So I came out of the spin and I kind of just stopped but the momentum threw me over because the bike's so fucking heavy yeah. and it landed on me. And luckily I, I had just started it and we had just left because if I, that fender header would have burned my fucking leg right off, right. It landed on me and I couldn't get out get it off. My partners had to get off, park his bike and pull it off of me. And so oh. he picked it up and we put it on the fucking uh, kickstand. And all I did, I didn't care. I just walked around it. And I seen them all, my paint, my paint, nothing, nothing, no scratching up. And then I looked at my fairing and right where I have, there's an image of Linda Blair, the exorcist. There was these scratches down the oh. And I was like, I just, I wanted to cry, just cry. I wanted to sit there, ah! <sighs> So I went out and I called Lee up 
you know Lee very well. Yeah. I called him up and I said, I think I messed up. And he was expecting a nightmare, so I sent him a picture and he's all, oh my God, this is minor detail. Send it to me. I'll <laughs> about another a couple of weeks and he sent it back and it was fine. But I, I did the same thing. It was a November morning and I was riding to the gym and I got on my bike and the lines in the middle of the road, the painted lines, I must've hit it right as I pulled out of my driveway and went to go my rear end. Phew, that one swung me around, landed on my knee. I broke, I broke up. Um, what did I break? I bent my fucking handlebars. I bent my fucking, broke all my controls. I fucked my knee up. Oh, my knee was killing me for days. Huh. Kirby cover, all, all, all fucked up. A primary scratched on the bottom, you know? So I was just, I've done it a couple of times. It's, you know, I'm going to tell you, Rob, if you ride, it's a good chance you're going to drop them from time to time. And I pack ride, you know what I mean? So, and I ride with a bunch of guys that ride, 85 90 100 miles an hour you know what i mean so yeah the odds are <laughs> you know the odds are against you if you're you know you know it's very rarely i cruise my dine is kind of souped and i i'm one of those 85 or 90 years yeah i move you know yeah, i know so, the i know the deal yeah man so i i, I just I, I mean and i know some of the guys and i know you know that you know been riding for a long time guys i mean biker friends of mine but i'll be oh what happened to him i'll fuck he dropped his bike last week hit some gravel or whatever, <laughs> or whatever so you know you're on two wheels bro it ain't like getting in a car and firing up a cigar or a fucking ball and turning on the tunes and going oh shit I <laughs> oh, let me get back over you got to pay attention to every little fucking thing you do everything in the road everybody coming at you it's just, it's, you know, to me, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, on two wheels, you have to yeah. pay attention, you have to pay attention to road conditions, you have to pay attention to every other idiot, you know, and so. Cell phones have become the biggest nightmare, especially I, like here in Arizona, there's no law, you can be on your phone and your car, so nobody gives a fuck, there's no, uh, really, there's no I thought penalty. That national law, I didn't nope. know that. <laughs> no, <laughs> you can text and job, dude, I see people like this all the time, dude, it's frightening. Yeah, dude. That's why I got. Uh, this is a wild west here, man. I, that's why what I have is what we call a thunder header. You know what I mean? So when I yeah. go th fucking, because we can split lanes here. You can split lanes there, right? Nope. Uh, yeah, not allowed. Well, here you can. So what I do when I'm splitting lanes or I feel they need to know I'm there, I pull my clutch in and I'm. Yeah. And I got cams in my bike and it's tuned. So, yeah. you know, so my bike is really loud. Yeah, I wake up when I come in from a run at two in the morning. All the neighbors in my neighborhood, <laughs> home. Steve's home. Yeah. so they know. Mine's quiet, so I can speed because I ride. I, you know, I drive. I ride real fast, so I don't want them hear me coming. You know, so right. yeah. Um. So what's it? I know you got a tour coming up in April. You're playing here in Tucson. I'm yeah, gonna do my. Are. I'm gonna do my best to make it, man. I I don't know. It's a Wednesday, so I don't know if like it really depends on couple factors but i'm gonna do my best to get there and, and just uh come and hang yeah okay. we're going out with death, death angel and testament right it's april 9th in uh, san luis obispo and postponed from um uh october november we were going to do it but uh yeah, just the testing risk and the yep. liquid then was probably a good idea a lot of tours were canceling and it wasn't a good idea so we postponed it but we are definitely doing it and i spoke yeah. to and uh, me and Chuck, we even went on my show on the vault and talked about, you know, look, we are definitely going to do this. And off camera, I said, Chuck, we cannot cancel nor postpone this next leg. Sick yeah. or not, go. Oh, it should be cleared up by then. And then this variant came on, but we're still, I mean, I spoke to, we're on. It's, it's happening. It's going good, down. man. Good, man. Fuck it. I think. I think just people just need to go do what they're going to do. And if you I, don't want to, if you don't want to, if you look, man, if you don't want to get sick, then don't go. That's so, but if you know, I mean, it's up, everybody has their own choice to do whatever the fuck they want to do, but we need to go make a living. We need to go do what we do. We need to, to make the people that want to see it. Cause I think people are just starved for um, entertainment and, and they, they want to be back part of a normal society again. I think it's been, uh, I, I think that it'll, it'll make it, feel like it's back to normal again like yeah. I, I, exodus, I got in the pit last night 
and I had a great time. You know what I mean? So I think yeah. that everybody's definitely jonesing for that. So let's do that one, but let's do Exodus. Kill. I just, I, I, it would be great for every, there isn't a negative aspect on that whole thing. I, I can't, I yeah. would see venues would be packed totally. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, everybody would do well. Everybody would do well on merch. Everybody would do well. They would love to come see it. The novelty I'm seeing the bet that would be like seeing Paul Diano come out and sing some songs with fucking names. I'd like, go to see that. The novel, what I would, I would wait a minute. Your maiden's going out and Diano's coming out. I, you, yeah. I, the front row right now. Are you kidding yeah. me? I would right fucking, now, how much, I'd how pay how big much, money for that. Five. Give me five. Are you yeah. kidding me? Word gets out that you're doing well we don't even need the word we'll tell everybody that's how we're gonna do it <laughs> but, yeah you know, that, you know the, the the trick is is and then you know what'd be great is if you got a bunch of different songs and no city gets the same two songs or oh, yeah man the same two together like one night you do ballad of leonard and charles with good riddance one night you do icono with you know fucking a man one night you do children with the, you know you'd switch it up a little bit and then they don't know so that makes them have to come see it if you're yeah. in Milwaukee you come to Chicago because you don't know what Dukes is going to see tonight yeah I'm let's go we'll I'm in dude Fuck. absolutely absolutely um so I'm excited for for you guys going forward I'm excited for what what uh I got going on and, and we I am too hopefully those pads um get to cross and we get to do something together. Um, I think I'm going to sneeze. Oh, no, I'm not. All right, cool. Good. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, man, you know, it'd be cool too, is we could like, you know, um, we could, I would love to, if we did tour, we could film it and, and make little videos and, and do stuff. And then uh, at one, at some point that I think um, you and I should meet up, somewhere at a halfway point and ride our bikes together for a, a couple of days and, uh, and just go hang out for a couple of days. Or we'll get bikes out there or rent a couple of bikes and then yeah. so we'll drop them up. Say, okay, we're going to rent some bikes and fucking. I've done that here. And we'll turn them in then and you do like that. So we ain't got to worry about right. I rent a, I rented a fat boy here in, in Scottsdale and I rode up all through the mountains and then, uh, and then, um, and then, and it's brought it back. And it was cool. Cause I just, Filled it up with gas. Here you go. Here's your bike. See ya. And I got in a fucking Uber and went home. And uh, yeah, it was killer. So. Go get myself a fucking Road King or Street Glide. Yeah. But, you know, boom. Let's do it, man. Yeah. I'm down. I'm down. That would be fun. Totally. And then we can tell fans. Fans can follow us on that. And we have a party. Yeah, dude. Ride. It would be like a fucking A, man. I'll, I'll, uh, I, I think we'll, I think I'm going to set that up. I think I'm going to get a, we're going to make this happen. Believe me, I'm like chomping at the bit right now. Let's go. So, yeah. So. Well, thank you very much, Zet. It's You're been welcome. awesome, dude. I'll talk to you soon. All right, my brother. Be good.